All right, welcome. Um, we are excited to have Myra Lu here today to share information about sexually transmitted uh, infections. My name is Laura Goldberg. I'll be the moderator for the evening. Um, Myra Lu is a primary care sports and family medicine physician working with an army unit at Fort Campbell, Kentucky. He did his family medicine residency in 2008 to 11 at the Madigan Army Medical Center in Fort Lewis, Washington. And then after two operational assignments, he completed the primary care sports medicine fellowship at the National Sports Medicine Consortium at Belvoir, Virginia. After fellowship, he was APD of the Family Medicine Residency at Tripler Army Medical Center in Honolulu, Hawaii, uh, prior to where he is uh, currently. Ah. Um, so this is uh, this talk series is presented by AMSSM and it is designed to serve as an adjunct to your individual programs educational programming. We hope to be able to give you direct access to educational experiences with dairy, various members of AMSSM and uh, have invited all of these guest speakers to come in who are experts in their area. Um, as well, hopefully you'll get something out of it for your CAQ examination prep. I know that we have specifically some talks on the CAQ, so um, hopefully this will add to it. Um, we ask that you mute your device's microphone, turn off your video, and then after the program, please take the time to complete an evaluation, uh, which is sent at the end of the lecture. It's really helpful for us in terms of knowing uh, if we're meeting our goals. Next week, we're gonna have a highlight on the CRN Research Summit. And we will be presenting again at 8.30 and we'll have specialists uh, from different areas coming to talk about uh, what they saw during that summit. So I am proud to have uh, Myra Liu here tonight from the US Army speaking to us about sexually transmitted infections. Go ahead, Myra. All right, let me go ahead and share my screen here. All right. Can you guys see that now? Yes. All righty. So here we go. All right, so thank you, Laura, and uh, thank you to the AMSSM Fellows online lecture series. Uh, for a chance to present this topic on sexually transmitted infections. Uh, again, I was, as Laura said, I'm Dr. Myra Liu. I'm a sports and family medicine physician currently at Fort Campbell, Kentucky. And as a military healthcare provider, I have one disclosure. And again, that is the views that are presented today are that of my, my own and are not the views of the U.S. Army or the Department of Defense. So this will be the agenda for the evening. As you can see, we're gonna start off with like a warm up case. Uh, there's gonna be some questions that just kind of stimulate internal thought. Uh, you don't have to actually put them in the, in the actual chat at this point in time. We'll talk about some history and prevention as far as for sexual transmitted infections. Uh, we'll talk about the actual uh, diseases and then we'll go into a little bit of a pre-exposure prophylaxis for HIV, as well as a case on extragenital manifestations of STIs. We'll kind of wrap it up with a CAQ question as far and a uh, rapid review slash conclusion. So here's our warm-up case to start. So you have a 20-year-old college junior swimmer who presents to the training room, complaining of painful urination and purulent discharge from his penis. He admits to having multiple female sexual partners, um, and he does he does this without use of a condom. Uh, you are able to order a nucleic acid ampli amplification test of his urine which reveals uh, both infection of chlamydia as well as gonorrhea. So the first question you need to ask yourselves is, is what other additional questions do you wanna know from this patient? Uh, what is the recommended treatments for both Neisseria uh, gonorrhea as well as chlamydia trachomatis? Um, can you treat his partner or partners as well? And do you have time and the ability to provide some sexual behavioral counseling? So to give you the overall numbers, there are 68 million STIs uh, in the US as reported by the CDC in the year 2020. Um, a large percentage of all new STIs occur among young people. So they define that as ages between 15 and 24 years old. And STIs go undetected due to a lot of times lack of symptoms 
and high rate of infection. So why do we wanna talk about this subject in a sports medicine lecture? Well, there's kind of twofold. Um, a lot of the athletes that we take care of uh, fall in the age range of that newly acquired STIs, as well as there's a perception of increased risk. So to kind of look into this more, I, I was going through the CAQ prep books and I saw that they highlighted a study back in 1997. So that was Nativ, and he looked at 2,300 college athletes and 700 randomized non-athletes as, as his controls. And he had them complete a confidential questionnaire assessing lifestyle and health risk behaviors over a 12 month period. Some notable trends in the athletes were less helmet use when riding motorcycles and increased use of alcohol. And the sexual behaviors you noticed was less safe sex and greater number of sexual partners. Now, if you dive deeper a little bit, uh, again, another old study, but two years earlier, uh, Miller uh, looked at US high school athletes versus non-athletes sexual behavior. And he did this by analyzing the youth risk behavior survey. And overall, you can see athletic performance had a positive effect on female athletes uh, with less partners, lower rates of sexual experiences, and lower pregnancy rates, whereas male athletes had more partners. So kind of the opposite effect. So what is the appropriate way to discuss sexual behaviors? And again, thinking about this is while you're in the uh, training room. Um, first, you wanna create a safe space for the patient. And that's not just privacy and confidentiality, but before having these talks with the athletes, it's important to identify your own implicit biases on sexuality and sexual topics. So after knowing your own biases, you need to use positive, affirming, and non-judgmental language when discussing sexual health. So to take a thorough sexual history, uh, which on the slide you can see is done by using this recommended five Ps method, uh, you want to ask about new sex partners, if they have more than one partner, or partners who have, who have or has had uh, sexually transmitted infections. Uh, you wanna ask about practices to include anal insertive or receptive intercourse, a uh, question about condom use or inconsistent use uh, when not in a, mono a mutually monogamous relationship, and ask about previously uh, sexually transmitted infections in the patient, as well as treatments or non-treatments. And you also wanna gauge if they have any intentions of becoming pregnant. So as far as prevention, uh, this includes encouraging vaccinations like hepatitis A, hepatitis B, and HPV, depending on their sexual practices. And it is also recommended to offer sexually active adolescents and adults with increased risk of STI uh, intensive behavioral counseling. So you may not have time to do this or the privacy in the training room, uh, so it can be done as a follow-up. And this can be done in person or web-based. And whatever the method, it's recommended that the intervention lasts at least 30 minutes to be effective. Uh, and topics that you can include in this are discussions about condom use, decreasing the number of partners, and abstinence from intercourse during STI treatment. And then depending on their practices, you might want to consider HIV prophylaxis, uh, HIV pre-exposure prophylaxis. All right, so there are many STIs that can be discussed. Um, what I wanted to do was focus on the these eight, uh, because they are eight of the top 10 STIs reported in the United States. Uh, topics are broken down on how they present with the first four presenting with that urethritis or cervicitis. And then we kind of transition to those that have genital lesions. So the first infection that we'll talk about is chlamydia trachomatis, uh, otherwise known as chlamydia. And this is the most common reported STI in the US with 1.5 million cases reported to the health department in 2020. You can see that more than half of the reports, uh, reported cases uh, were ages of 15 to 24 years old. Um, often chlamydia, like other STIs we'll discuss later in this lecture, um, are, are oftentimes asymptomatic. And so that contributes to the higher rates of infection. If the patients are symptomatic, they will often have painful urination, discharge, or even increased urinary frequency. So I put a few screening guidelines you can see here where the first one is annual screening is recommended in sexually active women ages 24 years or younger and in women 25 years or older who are at increased risk. So this is a recommendation by the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force, otherwise known as the USPSTF. 
And they also recommend, or they also report that they have insufficient evidence for screening of chlamydia and gonorrhea in sexually active men. So the reason for screening in women uh, is that infections can often lead to pelvic inflammatory disease, infertility, and even vertical transmission to unborn babies. Uh, the CDC also recommends screening for rectal chlamydia uh, using the nucleic acid amplification test in men who have sex with men and consider with women who are at risk and that risk being defined as uh, anal receptive intercourse. So testing is what we talked about using the nucleic acid amplification test on urine or the discharge. And remember to test the rectum or pharynx for extra genital infections if you have any concern. A good tip uh, if you're pa for your patients, if you're concerned of them having a, possibly, a possible urinary tract infection as well, as well as a chlamydia or gonorrhea infection, you need to instruct them on collecting two different urine samples. For SEI testing, it's the first void, which is the initial stream without cleaning the urethra. And with a urinalysis or culture for urinary tract infection, a second sample is achieved using the clean catch, uh, using the clean catch method of a midstream. So you can see that recent clinical trials and meta-analysis showed higher rates of treatment failures with azithromycin compared with doxycycline. So depending on when you were taught on like what the type of therapies are for, for chlamydia, uh, treatment is now recommended to be doxycycline, 100 milligrams twice a day for seven days. And your alternative treatment will be azithromycin one-time dose. And there's a difference between test of cure versus test of reinfection. So to go over that, test of cure is no earlier than four weeks. And that's for certain populations to include pregnancy, persistent symptoms, uh, concern for non-adherence to medication, or the use of secondary medications, which have may which may have lower cure rates. And the test of reinfection, uh, because the disease is so prevalent, like we said, this is the number one STI reported to the CDC, and partners will, partners will often reinfect each other. It's recommended for by the CDC for all chlamydia infections uh, that they do a test of reinfection in 12 weeks. So the next infection we'll discuss is Neisseria gonorrhea, which is the second most common reported STI in the US with about 680,000 cases uh, in 2020. The good thing to remember that if they have symptoms, uh, they'll present as very similar to chlamydia and the screening and the testing will all be the same. You can see that the, the treatment will be ceftriaxone. This is 500 milligrams IM. And if they're greater than 300 pounds, then you wanna up the dose to one gram. So new guidance reflects concerns for potential harm from overuse of antibiotics. So if you just have a positive sample for gonorrhea and not chlamydia, there is no more co-treatment for chlamydia. So again, I repeat, no more co-treatment if it's just positive for uh, gonorrhea. Uh, test of reinfection is not routinely done, but is considered for those who have repeat infections or other STIs like HIV. And the test of cure is done for extra general manifestations uh, at 14 days. So the next topic I'll, I'll talk about is uh, focused on the sequelae of uh, gonorrhea and chlamydia infections and the importance of testing and treatment. Now it's estimated that there's about 15% of untreated chlamydia uh, progress to PID, and this number can be actually higher with gonococcal infections that are untreated. With PID or pelvic inflammatory disease, there's damage to the epithelium by the infection, which allows the organisms to ascend the upper genital tract from the cervix. And the hallmark symptoms that you'll hear is that there's an abrupt onset of lower abdominal or pelvic pain. Sometimes they might have subtle symptoms like mild bilateral lower abdominal pain, worse with intercourse, abnormal uterine bleeding, increased urinary frequency, dysuria, or abnormal vaginal discharge. You might hear of terms of like perihepatic injury or right upper quadrant pain worse with movement, and that's also known as your Fitzhugh-Curtis syndrome. And the delayed diagnosis and treatment of PID can, can cause decreased fertility, ectopic pregnancy, and chronic pelvic pain. So with PID, the diagnosis is often clinical. Um, depending on your setting, if this is a primary care setting, a bimanual exam used to assess for cervical motion tenderness, 
Um, on the speculum exam, you might see mucopurulent cervical discharge. If you have microscopy that's available in your, uh, in your clinic, uh, saline microscopy might show a large number of white blood cells. And ensure you're doing a, a pregnancy test when you, before you do any treatment. Indications for inpatient treatment are going to be pregnancy, um, intolerance to oral therapy, high fevers, intractable abdominal pain, or concerns for a tubo ovarian abscess. If none of these indications are present, your outpatient treatment you can see as follows are the ceftriaxone, which is half the dose of what you would normally give for gonorrhea, plus doxycycline at twice the length that you would normally do for chlamydia. And then you want to add metronidazole, which is recommended by the CDC for 14 days. Um, typically, if there is clinical improvement in the first 72 hours, then patients who have a, an IUD in place do not need to have them removed. So mycoplasma, um, we might not often think about. Um, and it should be considered if there is persistent urethritis in both men and women. Testing is going to be by nucleic acid amplification tests and on patients with persist persistent symptoms after treatment of chlamydia or gonorrhea. You can also test uh, for mycoplasma in certain cases of PID and in males who have persistent epididymitis. So treatment will be a two-stage approach. And you can see it starts off with very similar treatment to chlamydia with a doxycycline for seven days. And during that time, you're gonna get a culture of the, of the actual uh, urine or the, um, the discharge. And then you're gonna, your treatment is gonna be based on mac, uh, macrolide sensitivity. So you can see azithromycin or moxifloxacin, depending on the sensitivities. So the next infection is gonna be a trichomus, uh, trichomoniasis, which is a trichomonas vaginalis, which is a non-viral STI often caused by the flagellate. Um, it has a high prevalence in the US due to oftentimes being asymptomatic and can last for years without treatment. If symptoms are present, this is where the patient might present uh, for females with vaginitis, with malodorous purulent discharge, and occasionally the abdominal pain and pain with intercourse. Uh, the testing you're going to do is a urethral swab culture or a uh, nucleic acid amplification test uh, for symptomatic patients with vaginal discharge at presentation, as well as considered for people with reoccurring urethritis. It is also recommended that there's annual testing of asymptomatic uh, women with HIV as well. So your treatment for trichomoniasis will be metronidazole. And you can see that for vaginal infections, uh, it is treated with a seven-day course of uh, adrenidazole, 500 milligrams twice a day. And this has been shown to have superior effectiveness compared to the previously recommended single two-gram dose. But now if it's for a male, so a partner, um, and you're treating a penile infection, that can be treated with a single two-gram dose. And then you want to do a test of reinfection in three months. Um, and like we said, treat the partners. So next I want to talk about just expedited partner therapy. Um, this is the clinical practice of treating the partners of patients diagnosed with chlamydia or gonorrhea by providing prescriptions or prepacked medications to the patients to take to his or her partner. And due to co-infections and antibiotic allergies, um, it's still recommended that the partner seek medical care. Um, but you can see in the bottom right-hand corner that this is a current map of the US uh, with the states that allow for expedited partner therapy. And it's almost all states with only four states where it's potentially allowable. So if this is something that you haven't been considering in your practice when you see someone with an STI, like chlamydia or gonorrhea, uh, I would urge you to consider it so you kind of, so we decrease the infection uh, in the partners and possibly the reinfection. You can see that chlamydia um, is gonna be the standard dosing, but gonorrhea is gonna be oral suffixing um, since we don't usually send patients home with syringes and injectable medications. Uh, this dose is also an 800 milligram, 800 milligram dose of suffixing, um, which is an increase in prior recommendations. And then lastly, I didn't put on the slide, but trichomoniasis can also be treated in a patient and also uh, be given expedited partner therapy for the, uh, for the partner. All right, so now we're gonna to transition to the ulcerative diseases 
And when we think about these, we typically think about herpes as well as syphilis. So herpes is a viral DNA which moves to the spinal cord sensory ganglion where it remains dormant until reactivation and persists for life. There is a high prevalence in the world. Um, HSV-1 and 2 are common infections and both can cause genital herpes. So no more thinking about HSV-1 above the waist and HSV-2 below the waist. Um, genital herpes is also under-recognized due to oftentimes having a subclinical presentation. And studies consistently report that 65 to 90% of patients with general HSV infections are unaware of its presence. So primary HSV infections re results from, again, previously unexposed people having close contact with someone who's actively shedding the virus from their skin or secretions. Typical, typical presentations is the vesicles, like in the picture there, on the genital, perianal, and even upper thighs. And there may be a prodrome of hours to days consisting of pain, tingling, itching, or burning at the site of exposure. Uh, the progression normally goes from eruption of the vesicles, then ulcerations, and then re-epithelialization during an outbreak, and this typically lasts about two weeks. As the patient has more reoccurrences, each episode tends to be milder. And then you can see the other uh, risk that we have is that people with HSV2 have a threefold increase in the risk of acquiring HIV. And this may be related to, this may be related due to open ulcers or the lymphocytes at the site of eruptions facilitating HIV invasion during sexual contact. So when testing, it's important to unroof lesions for specimen collection and PCR of the lesion is now the test of choice. Viral cultures, which have been done in the past, have a 50% sensitivity and less reliable when vesicles start to heal. HSV2 antibody testing can also help in diagnoses when there is a clinical history for suspicious genital herpes, but active lesions aren't actually present. And then treatment is gonna be based on whether it's an initial or recurrent infection. And you can see it's an antiviral like acyclovir or valacyclovir. And it's gonna be for a certain period of days or longer if the patient are, is still having symptoms. So the other ulcerative disease uh, is syphilis, which is caused by the bacteria Treponema pallidum. Uh, since the low numbers that were reported to the health department in 2002, syphilis has actually increased every year up to, you can see, 133,000 new cases in 2020. The symptoms include shankers, which are typically firm, round, and painless, and present at the site of infection. So to go over kind of like the different, uh, different types of syphilis, primary syphilis uh, presents with that chancre and usually resolves in three to, six, uh, three to six weeks, where secondary syphilis is a whole body rash. And be sure to look at the palms of the hands and the soles of the feet or areas where we don't typically see rashes. Uh, it's important to know that symptoms of primary and secondary, and secondary syphilis will heal with or without treatment. And the problem with the non-treatment will be organ damage in tissue syphilis or congenital syphilis during birth. And then we normally see that 10 to 30 years after the, the primary symptoms. So screening for syphilis is based on pregnancy, uh, at-risk individuals who, at-risk individuals or those with HIV, or if they have symptoms of primary, secondary, or tertiary syphilis. Uh, without any other diagnosis. Um, the way we do testing is it's going to be a serological test, and they're done in a two-stage two -stage approach. First, the non-treponemal, which is going to be your RPR or VDRL, are usually done to get a presumptive diagnosis of syphilis, and it's confirmed with a treponemal test. Uh, non-treponemal tests can cause false positive uh, with autoimmune disorders, as well as IV, IV drug use. And because of the higher rates of syphilis uh, nowadays and concerns for vertical transmission, some labs are actually doing reverse, reverse sequence screening, uh, which is the treponemal test will be done first. So this allows for high volume test, testing quickly, uh, early detection of recent infection and increased detection of latent infection. So your treatment of choice for this is gonna be 2.4 million units of benzathine penicillin 
uh, intramuscularly. And at this dose, the body is given a persist persistent level of medication for about seven to 10 days, which ensures the killing of the bacterium. If the patient has a penicillin allergy, it's recommended to possibly send them to allergy and immunology and kind of uh, recommend doing a penicillin desensitization or rechallenge test. And if you can't do that, the recommended uh, medication is going to be your set triaxone, two grams daily for 10 to 14 days. It's also important to warn the patient of a possible Jerex Hersheimer reaction. Um, that's going to be the febrile reaction with a whole body rash. And this is actually due to killing of the spirochetes and the subsequent immune reaction. It's a normal process and not an actual allergy to the medication. This can last for about 24 to 48 hours. And if they do develop it, uh, just make sure you're treating their symptoms with NSAIDs or antipyretics. And then again, counsel, counsel, counsel the patient to abstain from sex after treatment and until the sores are actually healed. So now we're gonna talk of shift a little bit to HPV or human papillomavirus. And this is actually the most common STI in the United States. And you can see there are over 200 types of HPV identified. Um, but the ones that we are talking about for sexually transmitted infections, uh, those risk factors will be um, history of multiple sex partners, initiation of sexual activity at early age, and not using barrier protection. Um, also other STIs to include HIV and people with immuno immunocompromised state, those are also risk factors. Uh, the presentation in regards to HPV caused by sexual transmission can vary from vaginal, penile, or even perianal papillomas to intraepithelial lesions. And the HPV strains that we worry about most are those that cause the cervical cancer. So you can see the recommendation for screening of high risk strains of HPV or those that cause cervical cancer, uh, they're given by the ASCCP, otherwise known as the American Society for Colposcopy and Cervical Pathology and the USPSTF, they recommend for HPV co-testing every five years after the age of 30, and this is what their path test. Now, we aren't going to talk about management for high risk strain HPV, which oftentimes can be referred to gynecology or primary care that does colposcopy and treatment, uh, and, but we will go ahead and kind of shift to talking about those strains that cause just the general lesions. Now, treatment is going to be based on the patient preference, and they can apply, and they can have either a self-applied or clinician-applied treatment. Of note of what I show you there, the clearance rates are going to be lower, or about 30 to 70 percent, with patient-applied treatments, and 70 to 90 percent with prior therapy and electrosurgery. And the best prevention of HPV is going to be vaccination and is most effective when administered before the onset of sexual activity. Vaccinations have been demonstrated to reduce prevalence in HPV in females, as well as intergenital warts and precancerous cervical lesions. And the ones we talk about is the non-avalent vaccine, and it protects against 90% of the high-risk strains that cause cervical cancer. So even if the patient that you're seeing has high-risk HPV or intergenital warts, it's important to offer vaccinations uh, of the non-avalent vaccine through the age of 26. And it's even indicated for those up to the age of 45 if they have certain risk. So that, that recommendation between the ages of 27 and 45 are gonna be made with a shared decision-making. So now we're gonna go ahead and shift to HIV and HIV as well as hepatitis B and C are transmitted through blood and other bodily fluids. The common transmission pathways are going to be sexual contact, higher with anal receptive intercourse, and needle sharing. So not just what you think about the IV drug users, but also people who share needles for steroids. Um, it's good to educate athletes about, the, about risky behaviors, while also reinforcing that HIV is not transmitted through sweat or saliva, and there have been no documented cases of HIV transmission during a sporting event. And so the USPSTF, recommend screening for HIV in those ages 15 to 65, but routine screening of athletes is not recommended. There's no recommended intervals for repeat screening, but to give you an idea in my organization, it's required every two years. 
Treatment for HIV is gonna be antiretroviral medications as soon as it is diagnosed. You wanna counsel the patient that adherence uh, is a strong predictor of antiretroviral therapy effectiveness and suboptimal medication adherence can produce uh, permanent resistance to an entire class of antiretroviral medications. You still wanna recommend uh, immunizations and they should be given on a standard schedule with some consideration of certain vaccines that must be given when there is a higher CD4 lymphocyte count. And with adequate treatment, patients and athletes can live longer uh, with HIV and it's not used to disqualify someone from, com from competition. So because HIV is more manageable uh, with medications that are like the antiviral, antiretroviral therapy, it's also important to talk about pre-exposure prophylaxis or PrEP in patients who are higher risk. So you can see there's a lot of indications for PrEP, but to kind of summarize it, the USPSTF recommends offering PEP, PrEP uh, to individuals at risk, including gay or bisexual men who have who have had gonorrhea or syphilis during the previous six months, those who share drug injection equipment, those who are HIV negative, but who have sex partners that have HIV, and those with inconsistent use of condoms during receptive or insertive anal intercourse. The two medications that the FDA approved are going to be uh, Truveda and Descovy, and they're both tenofovir um, but Descovy is those you can see are for those who are not at risk of vaginal exposure. And PrEP reduces the risk of getting HIV from sex by about 99% when taken as prescribed. And it's usually has to be consistently um, taken seven to 21 days to have that type of effectiveness. So every clinic has different ways of monitoring PrEP adherence and follow on HIV testing. So kind of ask your clinic what they do. And to give you an idea, in my system, again, the preventative medicine works with pharmacy to ensure proper dosing as well as follow on labs. So for the CAQ and primary care boards, have familiarity with diseases that are reportable to the health department. For this lectures, the, S the STIs that are reportable are gonna be your HIV, your hepatitis A, B, and C, syphilis, chlamydia, and gonorrhea. And also know that if you're working outside your clinic, how you would report to your, to your local health department. I live in the state of Tennessee, so I put an example up there. I attached the reporting form if I ended up having to see someone outside of clinic or presumably retreat, but had to go ahead and uh, report that to the state. So those were the eight of the top uh, 10 STIs reported to the CDC in the year 2020. I'm now gonna shift focus to two different cases. This is the case of the extra general manif manifestation. And I'll kind of read it to you. This is a 35 year old athlete uh, with a history of mild bilateral tricompartmental osteoarthritis who comes to the clinic with bilateral knee pain and swelling. Uh, he has no significant mechanism of injury, no history of buckling or locking, Pain with sitting for long periods of time, uh, going downstairs and squatting. So typical like telephemoral or tricompartmental osteoarthritis. Uh, recent history of fever, conjunctivitis treated with erythromycin ophthalmic gel uh, two weeks ago. So what else do you want to know? And just like our prior uh, warm-up uh, case, you can see we can use the 5P method there. Um, and I gave you the history he has three sexual partners in the past year, um, oral and vaginal insertive intercourse, uh, does not use condoms often, uh, treated for chlamydia last month, so that's kind of interesting, and not, not considering uh, pregnancy with his current partner. Um, so when you look at the, the MSK symptoms, I don't want you to get kind of tunneled with uh, your thoughts there because when you kind of, uh, when you scan out and you get all this other sexual history, um, you can he you hear about the eye symptoms, the STIs, and that should clue you on possibly reader syndrome, or this is going to be your reactive arthritis. Um, so reader syndrome, how I used to remember it, this is the patient who can't see, can't pee, can't climb a tree. Um, and you can see they have the MSK symptoms 
with conjunctivitis and urethritis. So the big thing to know is that the onset of this uh, arthritis normally occurs one to four weeks following the inciting infection. Um, if you do uh, join a fusion and you test the fluid, um, you'll often see, it often give you uh, nonspecific findings with elevated uh, leukocytes, predominantly neutrophils with white blood cells uh, in the counts of the two to 64,000. Uh, if you send it for culture, you might not actually give you an organism uh, on the culture. So for this patient, they were treated one month prior for chlamydia, which was the first step in trying to uh, treat the reactive arthritis. Now they have the symptoms of M the MSK symptoms. We want to treat the arthritis with anti-inflammatory medications or even steroids, depending on the chronicity. And it's important to tell a patient that who has Reader syndrome or reactive arthritis that even with adequate treatment, symptoms may last three to five months with most patients having complete resolution or little active disease at six to 12 months later. So this can actually persist for a long time. So that was our extra genital um, manifestation uh, uh, case. And then now we're gonna go ahead and switch to the CAQ question here. So Andy, if you're able to switch it to the CAQ question, And while he, while he does that, I'll kind of read this. Um, but this is the same as our warm-up case. This is our 20-year-old college junior swimmer uh, presents to the training room with a painful urination, the purulent discharge from his penis, and missed to multiple female sexual partners without the use of a condom. You order the nucleic acid amplification test of his urine, and you can see that he has both Neisseria gonorrhea and chlamydia trachomatis. So which of the following statements about sexually transmitted disease is correct? So A, you have the treatment of a single dose of ceftriaxone, 125 milligrams IM, and that's sufficient to treat both infections. Uh, B, treatment with a single dose of uh, benzathine penicillin, uh, 2.4 million units IM should be given empirically. C, the sexual partners of the patient should be notified as a possible exposure to a sexually transmitted disease and the patient should be offered testing for other possible infections. Indeed, the patient should be excluded from athletic competition while undergoing treatment because of the risk of spread via contact from one athlete to another. So I'll give you another couple seconds to lock in your choice. All right. And good. So you see that uh, C was, majority of people chose C. And to give you an idea, um, here you go, we'll kind of go over these answers. So A is, uh, it's not the right answer because it's not an effective treatment for gonorrhea. Because remember, gonorrhea is gonna be the 500 milligrams or one gram depending on the weight, and it won't treat the, uh, the chlamydia. Uh, B is not right due to that being the treatment for syphilis. And C is the correct answer. Uh, and for your practice, remember, you may also offer expedited partner therapy. And then D is also not is also incorrect because STIs uh, like Neisseria gonorrhea and chlamydia, as well as HIV are not grounds for athletic exclu exclusion. All right. So this is kind of, if you fell asleep during the early portions of the lecture, this is the take home points right here or the rapid review slash conclusion. Um, so remember, when assessing, and, when assessing and treating sexually transmitted infections, our goal is to treat to prevent transmission to others, as well as prevent long-term complications in the patients. Remember to use non-judgmental attitude and respectful language. And as far as for the, the diseases, chlamydia, your treatment of choice is now doxycycline, 100 milligrams, twice a day for seven days, with a test of reinfection 12 weeks later. Gonorrhea. Uh, your primary treatment is going to be that ceftriaxone that we talked about in the in the last case, um, 500 milligrams IM or one gram if the weight is greater than 300 pounds. If you're testing just for gonorrhea and that's all, and there's no positive chlamydia, no co-treatment of chlamydia is needed. Mycoplasma genitalium is suspected in persistent symptoms after treatment of chlamydia and is a two-stage therapy with doxycycline and then azithromycin or moxifloxacin depending on macrolide sensitivity. Trichomoniasis has a high prevalence with symptoms of vaginitis. Uh, treatment is gonna be metronidazole, 500 milligrams, 
preferred for seven days if it's a vaginal infection or two grams once if it's a penile infection. Herpes is highly prevalent worldwide. PCR testing of the lesion is first line testing and treatment with acyclovir or valacyclovir. Syphilis has increased infections yearly and needed to, and you need to treat with benzathine penicillin uh, IM. Remember to caution the patient on a possible jerex hersheimer reaction, which is not an autoimmune reaction. Uh, HPV is the most common STI in the US. Prevention with non-avalent vaccine is recommended up to the age of 26 and older in certain cases. And HIV antiretroviral therapy and adherence is key. You wanna make sure they vaccinate against other diseases on a standard schedule and they can still compete in sports competition. And those diseases that are starred are also those that are reportable to the health department. So I know that was a quick overview of STIs. These are kind of my references here. And I think if we have time um, for any questions, uh, I'll open the floor um, and thank you for the time this evening. Thank you, Myro, that was excellent. That was an excellent overview. I know that um, as a fellow, I covered a bunch of teams and it's always awkward when or hard when you're in a training room and somebody brings up a concern. So I, one thing I learned and I, I, I really like how you said multiple times to be respectful and um, open with your questioning, but also finding a place that is appropriate to have a proper history taking an exam um, is really important and also making sure that you have follow-up because as a fellow, you might be covering you know, a team here or there and maybe not be the primary physician. So um, I, I found that to be hard and a little less hard as you become the primary physician, but um, thank you for, for kind of giving insight in that. The other thing I noticed was the reporting, um, you know, the, the reporting is different state by state uh, as to how you do it, but it seems like it's pretty easy to look up on your uh, statewide Department of Health to see how they report it. Um, I had a question about HSV. So how, at what point do you put them on chronic therapy versus just doing you know, the three days or the five days for uh, recurrent infection? Yeah, Laura, that's a good question. So when you kind of, uh, Think about the practices, like I think the, the board answer for primary care boards is going to be after they have six infections in a year. And a lot of times patients, they don't normally get to six infections before they actually start asking to be on more of a daily suppressive therapy. Um, typically, and, or anecdotally, I see patients and they'll probably have like three or four infections and then they're asking for the, uh, uh, the suppressive therapy, which is going to be the daily uh, acyclovir or valacyclovir. Right. And I know that, uh, you know, being on any medication long term is hard. So I think it's my understanding maybe that you would do that for like a year and then see, then try and go off of it and see, is that, is that your understanding or, or how long do they go on it for? Yeah, definitely with, uh, like we talked about with the recurrent infections, often being more mild um, and sometimes even not as long uh, of a duration. Um, that is one where, yes, you can put them on for that six months to a year, and then kind of see if when you kind of pull it away, if they're having as many uh, uh, infections or reoccurrences. Um, if anyone has any questions, please put them in the chat. I have, I have one other question or thought. Uh, with chlamydia, I, you know, compliance is always a tough thing. So it's great to do the seven day treatment or, or whatnot, but at what point, like azithromycin was you know, the one dose. So I felt like it could have been more compliant, but if it, I mean, obviously if it doesn't treat it as well, but at what point do you say, oh, this person's not going to be as compliant or not as reliable? Yeah. And I think uh, depending on your system. So um, I have the luxury of, um, you know, working for a unit and I have, I can see the, the patients all the time. So it's like, okay, I can ensure that that compliance is going on. But sometimes when it's like working for a health department, or a clinic where um, you know you might not see the the patient for several weeks and you have that concern or recurrent uh, STIs and you're like okay maybe they're not using the medications appropriately 
that's where I would go ahead and uh, use the azithromycin one gram. Um, and they often make it in a powder form. So you can kind of mix it with water and give it to the patient right there in the clinic as well. Um, so that's, that'd be kind of my, my practice is just that if I had a concern of someone like leaving or going on a trip and not, uh, and not being able to adhere to the medications that I might just go ahead and give them the one gram in the clinic. Yeah. Uh, the, the other thing that's really interesting is the partner testing. I think that it's uh, really a partner treatment, I guess I should say. It's really tough in some of the environments that we work in where we're, we're not really getting the full picture. I work in a college setting, so that's I'm thinking between college setting and, and professional sports setting, it can be hard to get the partner, the knowledge of who the partners are. Um, so, but this was really, really helpful and and informative and kind of to the point. So thank you very much for the overview. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, if there's no other questions, I mean, I, I thank you guys again and make sure you tune in next week for the, uh, uh, the research summit stuff. So uh, lectures, yes. Excellent. Thank you. All right. Bye now. <laughs> Bye.